Okay. Uh, thank you all for joining. Uh, I'm really excited to be uh, your instructor this morning um, on day five of, uh, I'm sure, what has been a really fun uh, and exciting workshop uh, packed with information for you. Um, I'm Lauren Erdman. I, I'm a like fourth year starting in the fall PhD student um, in computer science. Uh, I've put this uh, workshop, like this portion actually together with my supervisor um, and we taught it together for years and I uh, have kind of taken it over um, in the past uh, couple years. Um, and so I'm excited today to talk to you uh, about similarity network fusion, clinical data integration, um, and then we're going to go deeply into survival analysis as well. So uh, this is all covered under Creative Commons license, uh, which I believe means you can share and remix this work. Uh, just make sure you uh, uh, attribute it um, and uh, share a like if you alter it. So like I said, uh, this is going to be all about clinical integration. Um, of course, this is a huge field, so I'm not going to cover it uh, in completion in any way. Um, I really encourage questions. So uh, we've got some awesome TAs, uh, and I know they've been helping you all week, and um, they'll probably be able to field your questions if you uh, send them along on Slack. Um, it is going to be a little harder for me to keep up on the Slack, uh, so also feel free to open your mic. Um, for especially for the lecture portion, um, if you have a question that you'd kind of like us to, you know, stop and, and talk about, um, or if there's a question on the Slack that maybe should get attention, uh, I just want to say the TAs, like, feel free to also open your mics and, and bring attention to that too. I'm happy to stop and uh, I really want everyone to be on the same page uh, in this. So uh, great, without further ado, um, the learning objectives. So just a quick overview of what I'm talking about when I say clinical data um, and some quick review on types of uh, single data analysis. Uh, we'll talk about some data integration methods such as uh, concatenating and clustering your data using iCluster and using SNF. Um, I just want to say in the afternoon, you're going to be doing a lot of similar work. I think uh, we, Shraddha and I worked hard to kind of make sure that it's um, complementary and it's really building uh, on what, like what she's gonna present later, we'll build on what I talk about now. Um, so some of it may be review and some of it may be uh, an extension. So uh, also just keep in mind, uh, a lot of these concepts may come up later, uh, even in another session later today. Um, and we're gonna talk about some ad advantages and drawbacks of different methods you might choose. Um, and then how kind of survival analysis may come into the mix. And the reason I'm including survival analysis here is uh, to kind of drive it home. Like how do we make this now clinical um, and, and build a model that could be used uh, clinically and evaluate it. So uh, patient data, that's really what I'm talking about when I say clinical data. Um, so that could include you know, genetic data, uh, expression data, uh, epigenetic data, microRNA, protein data. So these are like omics data sets, but we could also have things that are like just clinical, like from the chart uh, data, uh, questionnaires uh, that patients fill out so you can assess them, uh, <clears throat> maybe some imaging that's been done on the patient, um, or even uh, aspects, whoops, even aspects of their diet. Uh, so we've worked with uh, nutritionists, for example, who uh, will have extensive diet information on their patient. Um, but why would we want to integrate all of these types of data? Well, one reason might be to identify more homogenous subsets of patients. Um, these might respond similarly to a given drug. So if the patient's behaviors and their his clinical history is similar, and um, that may be the case that the same drug will actually have a similar impact on these patients. Um, they also might have a similar prognosis. So um, if all these features are similar about the patient, it may be that their actual clinical progression is uh, similar as well. Um, they may respond better to similar clinical management. So not just drugs, but different interventions uh, that are done. Um, so you would, may wanna group them and, and identify those similarities there. So one type of single data type analysis, which I'm sure you're all familiar with is um, clustering. And so here, this is showing uh, gene expression data for 1800 genes. Um, this is from a PNAS paper in 2005. Um, and so what they did was they collected gene expression data. Uh, they selected the most varied genes from those. So as you can see, this list is not 18,000 genes. 
Um, and they performed hierarchical clustering. So that's what you see up here. This is a dendrogram hierarchically clustering these genes. And here they identify two clusters. Um, so they identify genes that are associated with differing between uh, these clusters um, using ANOVA, uh, and they corrected for multiple uh, testing or multiple hypothesis testing. And so that's what you see these genes here um, that are really driving kind of the separation between these groups. And from this, what they found really nice and neatly is um, a difference in survival uh, of the patients uh, with glioblastoma multiform. So um, it's a, a nice example of where you take uh, data that is very uh, omics based, um, you find a pattern in that, and then you see that pattern kind of propagate to a clinical outcome, okay? Um, so I just wanna dig into this KM curve that we're seeing. This is actually just plotting our data here. So um, in this case, this is laying it all's data. Um, but what's happening here is uh, you see that the survival for group one uh, is much longer, the median survival is much longer than it is for group two here. So uh, this data that's being plotted is showing the proportion of patients that are uh, dying um, from glioblastoma multiform uh, with each one of these uh, events here, each drop. And so as this falls faster, many more of these patients died sooner. Whereas in group one, these patients survived much longer. Um, and even at two years, more than half of that group actually uh, was fine. They were, um, they were still surviving. So the, pr the probability, the way you could interpret this is the probability for surviving one year here is 80% for group one. So quite high for group one but only 20% for group two. So prognostically, these are, are very distinct groups um, here. Sorry, guys, just lost my clicker. There we go. Um, and then what else we can see is there's censored observations. So there's observations where we see this person uh, lived at least uh, half a year, but we don't actually have more information about them beyond that point. So that's why these points are here, um, just showing this is the information we have on them, um, and we can include that in our model, um, but we can't say more about it. So we don't know if they survived beyond that point. So here, Hi, Lauren. We, yes, uh, yeah. Quick question, sorry, yeah. it's very yeah. early here. <laughs> so Great, is there yeah. a temporal component to the gene expression data? Because there's no, one for the there wasn't. Line. Yeah, exactly. There wasn't a temporal component. That's a really good question, actually. Um, off the top of my head, from what I can remember, no. Uh, I believe this was baseline, um, and I believe it was from their tumor. Um, but that's a great question, because it could be that they're picking up just the progression of the tumor, too. Um, so it could be that um, maybe the people in group two, um, that gene expression data was collected at a different time point. Um, and so right. It could look like, you know, it's further along, but maybe if you collect um, like a stage four tumor from these, uh, these group two, uh, one folks, um, then it could be that in, in that view, their uh, lifeline is, is quite shorter, but good question. And that's actually really yep. important to consider when you're doing this kind of clustering. What pattern are you actually picking up here? Like, are you picking up a difference in the tumor at a given point in time? Or is there something actually, are you just, collecting different samples from these patients. Um, and maybe there's some different aspect that's that's going to reflect in this prognosis that you find. Yeah, Thank great. You. Thank you. All right. So here, um, there's a, a work in cancer cell uh, by Verhoek et al, uh, where they want to go beyond the single data type integration. Um, and they essentially um, add more and more genes um, through this, um, uh, sorry, they have gene expression data, um, but they select their genes based on more different types of data. So these are still gene expression data, I believe, um, but they're selecting genes based on, you know, copy number variation, alterations, mutations, um, and, uh, and then the actual gene expression itself. Um, and then they also find uh, that they're not actually able to, when they do this, they're not actually able to differentiate these different groups. So as you can see, the p-values um, differentiating the, the groups from the baseline group um, are very large. 
Um, so it doesn't always work out. Sometimes you're finding things that are not going to be related to your actual clinical outcome. Um, yet it's still identified proneural neural classical and mesenchymal groups. They just didn't have uh, significant differences in their uh, survival. So now uh, let's say though, you don't wanna just use your gene expression data. Like Sink brought up, you know, there could be differences uh, in that data that you wanna kind of um, also include other data to augment um, that clustering that you're doing. So some approaches to doing this are, uh, which I'll go over here, um, are concatenating and clustering your data. So essentially taking these different data types, putting them all together in one mega database and now clustering that database. Um, another one is Shen et al.'s iCluster, uh, which is a popular method and um, has been developed since 2009, but I'm just going to talk about like uh, the really basic version. Um, and then similarity network fusion, which I'm also going to talk about in much more depth here. Um, and there is uh, more work forthcoming on this, um, but we'll also use it as an example for what we're going to implement later, um, really to get your feet wet, kind of taking a new tool um, off CRAN and just uh, using it and um, understanding it more deeply. This is not an exhaustive list. And in fact, uh, Later today, Shraddha is going to actually show you even more of these kinds of techniques. So I'm not going to go too deeply into all of these because um, there's so much more to find. Uh, OK, so concatenate and cluster is super simple. Uh, it's truly what it sounds like. You just concatenate your data together, and then you cluster this database. So before, uh, in the work I showed you before, they're only clustering gene expression data, OK? And in this one, it would say, OK, now cluster, uh, put these all together, treat this as one long kind of row of features that your patient has, and now cluster your patients uh, based on all of this data. OK, so then you've concatenated. Now you can cluster. Um, and so here I'm going to just talk quickly about hierarchical clustering. Um, so what you will have uh, when you do the concatenating cluster or actually any clustering, you'll have a uh, distance matrix, which is what I show here. So let's say each A, B, C, D, E, F is a patient, okay? Um, and the distance matrix always has the same rows and columns, okay? Because it's comparing all to all. And so here uh, in the middle, the distance between an individual to themselves is zero, right? So that's what that is interpreted as. Um, also, the lower and upper triangles are equal. So the distance from B to A is the same as the distance from A to B. This isn't always the case in the distance matrix, uh, distance matrices you develop, but um, far and away most common. This is like by far the most common uh, type. Now, um, each of these uh, numbers is representing, for example, B to A, how far are these from each other? Um, and so if we look across this, we see that the minimum distance uh, other than zero, so individuals to themselves, is um, F to D. So this is the first uh, kind of uh, agglomeration um, or clustering that we would make when we make hierarchical clustering. So it's number one in the hierarchy. So when I talk about hierarchy, uh, what I'm talking about is uh, maybe dendrograms, as you see in them, or uh, what we can see here where we have um, F and D is the first one to get grouped together here. So here at 0.5 distance, uh, at that point, D and F become one cluster with each other. Um, and then there's <clears throat> different ways to uh, represent uh, this grouped distance uh, from new points. You could either average it, you could take the maximum, or you could take the minimum distance from new points. Um, so each of these have their own implications, uh, but here, let's say we're averaging. So then uh, the next one, um, as you move up, is going to be A to B. Um, so these guys get grouped next, okay? So if you were to split uh, your clusters at this point, so let's say we, we did a split at uh, 0.75 here, we'd have A and B in a group, and we'd have D and F in a group, and everyone else, uh, E, C, would be in their own group. They don't cluster with anyone yet because they're very far from other um, individuals. So as you uh, go further out, we see that E is actually closest to the DF 
uh, cluster. And so then they would get grouped in there. So if you draw the line up here, now we have D, F, and E all in a group. So here, D, F, and E all in a group. We have C in its own cluster, and then A and B are in their group, okay? And then again, as you go further, C now gets grouped in with that D, F, E group. Um, and so if we split it up here at two, we could say we've got one small cluster, A, B here, which does seem um, in our graph here, it does seem like it's a bit further away from everyone. Um, and then we've got a, a kind of bigger group um, that holds the majority, which is DFEC. Uh, and then these guys are all grouped together, okay? So when you're looking at agglomerative clustering or hierarchical clustering, this is how you would be interpreting it. Um, you see it stepwise growing um, into grouping everyone into some groups. And at the end, uh, with the largest distance, everybody is in a single group. So if we drew the line up at three, we'd say, yeah, this, is, this entire group is one cluster. OK, so you can actually split it many different ways, and it's a nice flexibility that comes with hierarchical clustering. Um, so but with this, like I said, you know, you can make that cut in many different places. What's the best one uh, to do? So there's lots of options. You can just cut it by eye uh, and also not just by eye, but um, by kind of intuition or, or what makes the most sense when you look at those clusters after the fact. Um, so that is valid. I think clustering, it's, it's quite an art form. And I see it as much more for data exploration and really understanding the data you have in hand. Um, so I think it's reasonable. But another thing you may want to explore is the silhouette statistic, um, which I'm going to go over uh, in the next slide. Um, and then eigengap uh, from Tib Sharani actually is a, another really nice option. Um, and they're all very similar. Then there's many more actually that you can use um, that, uh, yeah, I, I encourage you to check out if you're interested. But that said, if you do these basic ones, um, uh, then you also should be fine. Uh, it's, it's more to understand the data that you have and really understand what your clusters are representing. Similar to what we saw here, where if you kind of just zoom out and look at the data, this A, B group is pretty far from the others. So it would be reasonable to kind of draw the line up here and say, yeah, we've got this group that's far out here and then we've got this group that's in here. That said, if it seems like C is a real outlier, it also may be reasonable to cut it um, around here and say, we've got a DFE group that does seem pretty close. Um, we've got C that's a bit of an outlier and then A and B that are truly on their own. Um, so like I said, you know, it's, it's more about really understanding the data that you have. Um, Lauren, yes. A uh, couple questions in Slack. Maybe you could clarify for everyone. Yes. Uh, what does the X and Y mean in mm -hmm. the clustering, and which yes. covariates are we clustering? Yeah, on? these are really good questions. Thank you so much, Heather. So um, here, the X and Y axis. So these um, uh, are the features that the clustering was actually um, based on. So these two questions in this slide, they are related in the sense that. Um, the covariates or, or the data that you're clustering on, um, it creates this uh, matrix and it can be whatever. So uh, you could be clustering based on, um, you could be clustering based on methylation, you could be clustering based on methylation and uh, gene expression. So here, um, it could be these. But then here in this graph, we've got a two dimensional um, uh, data set here. And so this graph here actually represents clustering uh, between two features. So we could say maybe gene one and gene two. Um, so this could be gene one and gene two. And it's just much easier to interpret this on um, a, like two feature axis. So like an X and Y axis. Um, and so then the distances here uh, represent the distance between um, this A, which is defined by um, the X and Y axis points, um, and then B, these X and Y axis points. So each of them have two features that are used to create this distance value um, here that is representing how far they are from each other, okay? So in this case, this example, it's only two features. So it could be one methylation probe and one gene expression um, value. Um, but in practice, usually it's many, like we saw before, you know, those top, um, 
uh, gene expression values. It could be um, your entire gene expression array. Um, you could be clustering based on your um, all of your methylation data. Um, so it really, it can be whichever features you'd like. Um, but in this specific example, this is just arbitrary, just two axes. Okay, I hope that was clarifying. Um, all right, so the silhouette statistic, I really like this statistic for kind of understanding the intuition of what clusters you come up with. Um, and so uh, it's just a nice piece of history. This has been around for a very long time. Um, so uh, from 1987, um, and it really is to show how graphically well each pattern, but here we can say observation. So when they're talking about a pattern, you can consider that as like a patient, um, an observation, um, or uh, a individual. Um, so for each pattern, so each patient, let's say, in class CR, uh, we're finding the difference between the average distance to all other patterns in other clusters, so all patients in the other clusters, subtracted from the average distance to all the patients in the same cluster as that individual, and then divided by the max. So one thing straight off the top is, if one per, if an individual is closer to um, to individuals in all the other clusters than they are to their own cluster, this is going to be a negative statistic. And it's essentially representing that maybe that person should be in a different cluster. If they're closer to people in all other clusters than they are to individuals in their own cluster, um, that's kind of a bad sign, right? Um, so that's uh, where the negative positive comes in. And then you can look at the scale. So if people are like pretty close to the other clusters, but they're kind of close to the same cluster, again, it seems like borderline. It's almost like they're not in a cluster. Um, so I'm just going to show, nope, um, what we could see here. So an example of that is, let's say we put C in a cluster uh, with uh, E, um, and we uh, wanted to compare the silhouette here. So a cluster of C and E, but we're looking at the silhouette for E, E is actually closer to D and F. If they're in a different cluster, it might make sense to actually put them in that uh, in the cluster with D and F. So the silhouette statistic for E, if they're clustered with C, is going to be probably negative because they're not very close to C, but they're quite close to these guys in another cluster, uh, D and F, okay? So what silhouette does is it does that individual by individual and produces a plot like this that's showing the silhouette value for each individual, so the subtype here is the groups that you maybe have created in your clustering um, that need to be considered here. And then each line is one individual. And so you can see within each cluster, um, how much are the individuals, how much should all those individuals be in that cluster? Or maybe they're actually closer to individuals in other clusters. So what we see really markedly, uh, markedly here is in cluster one, um, a large group of those patients maybe should be in a different cluster. They're, they're not closer to individuals in their own cluster than they are to individuals in different clusters. And that's why they're showing up as negative here. And that's why I really like the silhouette statistic to give you just like a nice snapshot of, you know, are the individuals I've clustered close to the individuals they are clustered with? Or should maybe they be put in a different cluster because they're actually closer to individuals in those other clusters? Or maybe it represents, uh, if we have a lot that's close to zero, maybe it's kind of on a continuum um, and our data isn't actually grouping well. Uh, that's also something that you may find when you're clustering, that you're kind of just drawing lines in a continuous spectrum. Um, and these groups are not kind of held together very tightly, as you might expect. All right. Um, so I cluster, uh, OK. How do we reassign for values? Uh, do you mind uh, rephrasing that? Um, the Sorry, I meant how do we reassign for the, the bad assignment? Do we just reiterate over yes. the same process? OK, exactly. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, so you just reiterate. You know, sometimes you may find um, if you have many clusters, 
um, that you're having a lot of negative uh, values. Um, and then maybe you just need fewer clusters. Um, maybe there's one big cluster that actually everyone should be in and then uh, a small cluster that's kind of an outlier. Um, yeah, and then you could also try that because um, though with this silhouette, I might try to actually group them because um, if you're getting a lot of negatives, it means they're close to other, like another group. Um, so you could try a different random initialization. Um, if it's a clustering that like jumps around a bit, you know, maybe it just got you into like a bad grouping. Um, hierarchical clustering is not random. So uh, that will not help you like rerunning it. You should uh, reproduce the same hierarchy. Um, in which case with hierarchical clustering, you may just want to cut it at a different point. Um, so you may just find, like I showed before, this wouldn't be the cluster you'd come up with. But um, if you're finding that your groups look wrong, um, you could also try a different clustering approach. Um, but yeah, you'd really want to iterate it um, in different ways. Um, but most often, more groups is not what you actually will want to do. If your silhouettes are negative, you'll usually want fewer groups. Um, all right. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Um, all right, so I cluster. Um, again, I cluster, these all continue to be developed. So um, I just want to go over the real basics of it. Um, but essentially, they're uh, trying to find a latent variable, a Gaussian latent variable model. So it's a mixture of Gaussians here. And a mixture of Gaussians is one where you will have some kind of initialization. Um, sorry, we've got an alarm going off here. Uh, you'll have an initialization. Um, and you could find that when you rerun it, um, you'll actually get slightly different clusters out. Um, but what uh, iCluster is doing is actually um, building up that uh, latent variable model using data from different groups. So trying to find the same latent groups across different data types here. Um, and so they're doing a sparsity regularization. So if you're familiar with Lasso, uh, what it's trying to do is basically drop out features that are not uh, useful here. So that are not actually um, contributing to that grouping that you're uh, developing. And then uh, the latent variable bed is shared. So that latent variable is, um, oh, interesting. The latent variable is um, the grouping. So the groups that are assigned, they're shared between these different, um, these different data types. Um, and then it iterates so that uh, you're finding the same latent groups. But the key thing is they're shared. So you're looking for information that is um, consistent across all of these different data types. Uh, so groupings that come up as consistent between the different data types. Um, so a drawback to that is uh, currently uh, it may take a bit more, but uh, at the time, uh, so even a few years ago, Latent group. Uh, good question. So latent groups are different than collinearity. Latent groups are really groups, uh, subtypes, clusters. Um, so what it's trying to do is find clusters of patients um, that are shared between these different um, data types. So finding, um, if we took the GBM example from before, um, finding uh, those two clusters, but finding them through um, the copy number data, the methylation data, the mRNA data, and the microRNA data. So um, finding that consistent grouping between them. Um, so a latent group, that would be like two latent groups, and it wants to find those two groupings in all of those data types and have them reinforce each other. Okay, so it's different from collinearity that way because it's, um, it's not the correlation essentially between uh, features, yeah. Awesome. So yeah, so there's a lot of manual pre-processing though for this because you have uh, these different data types and they're looking for latent groups. Uh, you can only kind of load so much in memory. Um, so uh, it takes about 1500 genes um, and I'm sure you all have a, a good grasp of the genome. That's a very small number uh, relative to the whole genome. So you're, you're doing some major feature selection upstream and that will dictate essentially what you find downstream. Um, so depending on how that feature selection was done, uh, you're kind of setting your course uh, for what your results may be. Um, and in that way, there's many steps in the pipeline uh, for that. Um, it's mostly done in the feature space. Um, 
so I'm just, I'm actually going to read this because I'm not, I'm trying to think of what point I'm making here. Um, ah, so it's not combining the features to find a grouping, it's finding the groupings in the individual features. So if there's a grouping that you would get by combining the features, you will not find it here. Um, it has to be kind of a discoverable grouping um, from methylation and microRNA, for example, um, on their own uh, without combining them, but they'll reinforce each other. Um, and, it, and this is really important. It focuses on similarity across data types. And, and this is a similar point to what I was saying uh, in this previous one. Um, so what if there's complementary information? What if there is a grouping of patients that is very obvious in microRNA, but it's not obvious in your um, uh, methylation data? That complementarity will not actually be found. It, it won't be used. Um, and so that is that to me is a, a major constraint here. Um, and so it is just that which um, Wang et al. set out to um, improve with similarity network fusion. So this is work by Bo Wang. He's actually at Princess Margaret um, as faculty in, um, I think it's, um, oh shoot, now I'm, I'm gonna butcher his, uh, his uh, faculty, but uh, needless to say, Bo is back. He uh, left us for Stanford and he's now faculty at U of T. Um, and he developed similarity network fusion when he was in Anna's lab. Um, in 2014. And the idea is um, instead of um, using the features um, as they are, uh, actually creating a patient similarity matrix first, and then uh, finding the complementarity and uh, the similarity between these uh, matrices by uh, combining them through fusion. So I'm going to go through that. I know those are a lot of like airy fairy kind of words uh, I'm saying here. Um, so step one uh, of this is to create data type similarity, uh, specific similarity networks. And so I before talked about distance matrices, similarity matrices are essentially an inverse of that. Um, okay, so where before uh, our center, like our diagonal of this matrix was zero in the distance matrix before. Oh, thank you. So Bose in laboratory medicine and pathobiology. Um, for some reason, I thought he was in medical biophysics, but uh, I'm glad I didn't <laughs> say that. Um, so, uh, but uh, the similarity matrix here, it um, is showing the most similarity on the diagonal because an individual is most similar to themselves, okay? So in that way, it's kind of inverting the logic of the distance matrix, okay? Um, so here, uh, we've got our expression, our gene expression data, um, and instead of making a distance matrix, we're making a similarity matrix. Um, and we'll be doing this later in R. Um, and uh, what's important, I'm going to show, I'm going to be representing these similarity matrices like networks. Um, and the key thing is, um, these are the same. So this heat map here that is showing the similarity network uh, here, or the similarity matrix, it is a network, okay? Uh, so when there's no connection here, this means the similarity is zero. It's very, very small. Um, and when there is a connection that's uh, very thick, it means that they are very similar. They're very closely related, okay? Um, so uh, we can think about these matrices as networks as well. And so you worked with Cytoscape um, yesterday. Uh, so similarly to that, the similarity network can be loaded into Cytoscape and graphed in that way too. Um, so here, uh, we've got two networks um, for two different data types. Um, and what happens with the fusion iterations is these matrices are essentially sparsified. So only the most similar um, individuals are kept or the most similar linkings are kept. And uh, essentially a matrix multiplication happens. Um, they're multiplied by each other um, and then updated. And this is done multiple times. And that's what this is kind of representing here is that they're they're um, updated by multiplying that sparse matrix of itself to the other data type um, and updated again and again uh, until they uh, aren't changing much anymore. So they kind of um, uh, converge to uh, a specific matrix that um, isn't updating. Um, and then there's just a linear combination at that point because they are not changing and they're quite similar to each other. Um, and that 
results in your fused similarity network. Um, and in effect, what that does is it is able to pass the information between these two networks to each other um, to create something that it includes the complementary information. So if there's a very strong signal, let's say um, in this network, these guys are very, very tightly linked. Um, but especially, so these guys, this will be dropped because this is absolute zero. Um, uh, it may be dropped it because it's zero, but if it's small, it won't be totally dropped. It'll actually get reinforced. And so that complementary information will be included. But here, what else we can see is um, this link here. So it's very strong linkage here um, and a light link here. It will get reinforced. Um, and that's uh, shared information that will be boosted um, through SNF. Um, so it's pretty nice for that. But then you can also see where there's kind of like light linkage, um, not a lot from both of them. So like, I would say like low information linking these two here, uh, they actually end up getting dropped um, because it's like, they're not that related and all the data types are saying they're not that related. So it's kind of moving them all um, to a more extreme version. Um, uh, all of the links are being moved to a more extreme version of themselves. So you get essentially a stronger signal from your data in completion um, after running it through this uh, procedure. So here's a case study, and this is actually from uh, the SNF paper. Um, one sec. Okay, so here in the SNF paper, uh, they're fusing the methylation data um, gene expression data, so mRNA expression, and then microRNA expression data. Um, and then from each of these, they get a similarity network. So I'm gonna actually take a moment to um, uh, go more in depth on how you would actually interpret these. Uh, so uh, what we see in this top one is pretty nice uh, groupings here. So uh, kind of a block structure, and that's what you wanna see when there's a good similarity network, um, then you are gonna see very strong blocking um, of your different uh, groups. So these are patients here. Um, and so we see these patients are quite similar to each other. Um, these, this group of patients is quite similar to each other. This group, they're dissimilar from other groups, but they're not super similar to each other either. So they're kind of the other group, um, okay? Um, and so then if we were to compare across data types, we could see in the microRNA data, it's not so structured. So it seems like in this data, um, kind of individuals are sort of all over the place. There is some like uh, this, this seems like a bit of a cluster here. Um, and then these guys seem somewhat clustering, but honestly, like this whole bit, they're kind of related to each other. So um, in terms of how I would interpret this, I would say, you know, you're not getting great clustering out of the microRNA expression, but it may be that there's some similar information. So maybe this group down here, this small group that's consistently grouping together, that'll probably get boosted now in our um, similarity network fusion. And so that's what we see actually. So we get this really tight uh, group down here. Um, we get this group uh, that tightens up here, uh, which is actually combining information from all of these. So some of these groups actually get combined um, to create this uh, that it's not being kept in these, uh, where in uh, the gene expression data, it seems like there's many more little clusters. Um, it's grouping them all together. Um, and then in, uh, we have one big group that again, is kind of our other group. Like they are the lightest color. They have the least similarity to each other. Um, so again, how you would interpret this is like, these guys are pretty heterogeneous. These guys are quite homogenous. Um, they're very tightly linked and based on just like the brightness and the, and the distinction um, of that uh, grouping there. Um, and so this was done actually in Cytoscape, this, this figure here, um, and uh, it's just representing actually this exact thing. But what's nice is um, Bo went ahead and um, colored the linkages between them based on what is actually supporting uh, that linkage there. So what's supporting the similarity? Um, and we can see that, you know, there's a big clump here that seems like it's a, um, a gene expression and methylation data. So it seems like the microRNA data is not contributing a lot um, to a subset of these guys, um, but there are some uh, that are being contributed to, though there's very few that are having the full uh, contribution from every single data type. So 
uh, the nice thing about SNF is it can kind of um, be adding this information from different data types and kind of throwing away low information data types as well, just not really worrying about it. So when they uh, went ahead and looked at the clinical properties now of these subtypes, um, they were uh, happy to find actually that uh, especially this subtype here, um, it has a longer um, survival time. So there's a, a quite a distinction clinically between these groups uh, that they're finding. Um, they also found uh, that the age is lower. So it's a, it's a younger group of patients. Um, and finally, um, the treatment response is really different um, for one of the subtypes as well. So um, in subtype one, um, the treated versus untreated groups um, are really distinct. This one, so I'm not too sure what this last one was uh, about. Um, it must be the treatment response, though it is only in subtype one. Um, and so that would be this big guy here. Um, yeah. So just some advantages and disadvantages. We've talked through it, but uh, to list them out here for you. Um, one great thing is you get integrative feature selection. Um, you can grow the network. Um, hmm, advantage. Ah, growing the network requires additional work. So because you're doing everything in network space, when you have more patients, um, you're making it a larger computational task, a much larger computational task. So um, I would say the computational limitation here is the number of patients. Um, in the last example, I showed you there's 200 patients. What we're going to do today has 200 patients. Um, if you have, I've tried it with 5,000 patients, it takes a long, long, long time to run. Um, so Bo is working on that, um, uh, solutions to kind of expedite this, but um, that's just something to bear in mind here. Um, yeah, it's unsupervised. So even though I'm linking this all to a supervised um, kind of outcome, like survival or patient age um, or treatment response, at the base level, SNF is unsupervised. And so I think it's really important to um, kind of set your expectations about what you're gonna get from it. It's describing your data. So uh, one big thing is if you have um, kind of uh, group effects or um, I should say batch effects in your data, that's probably what you're gonna find actually using SNF. Um, it's, it's a very effective way to find all the problems with your data. Um, so I also recommend it for just exploring your data, even if it's not the main part of your analysis, um, finding kind of batch effects or effects that are consistent across a lot of your data types and may um, really mess up your analysis down the line. Um, I think it's very good to check your data for that. Um, but some really good things, you know, it creates a unified views of patients on multiple heterogeneous sources. So here, these are all omics data types I showed you here, um, but we're going to have no omics data in um, the data integration we do at um, uh, in the lab. So uh, you could really include any kind of data here. You could be integrating different data types from this, um, including, let's say, uh, we also had imaging data um, on these patients. Let's say we had some radiomic features. Um, on the imaging that had been done on the brains for these patients, then we could actually integrate that as well. So that could be its own additional um, feature set. We make a similarity matrix for it, we fuse it, um, and now we have an uh, even larger fusion. So you don't have to have everything on the kind of same like omics scale. You can also be integrating just totally different data um, into this. So it's, it's a huge flexibility. Um, and yeah, just repeating what I just said. Um, and no need to do gene preselection because you're doing everything in the patient similarity space. Um, the number of genes doesn't matter. Uh, it just matters that you get that similarity matrix out uh, from those genes. That said, you don't have to, but in practice, sometimes it is useful to do this preselection if that's what your actual research question is. So if you're really interested in a, a specific pathway, um, subsetting your genes to that pathway or subsetting all of your data to um, only omics data that is in that pathway, it would be useful to do because um, it's, it's what you're actually looking for. Similarly, um, work I've done uh, with using similarity network fusion in neuroimaging um, is to, again, if there's a pathway or a certain circuit that you're interested in, 
including all that extra data. Um, so all those extra measurements from other parts of the brain, it's not useful. It, it adds um, additional information that you're not actually caring about. So um, including everything, what I found in, in that analysis was including everything. It was giving me these really broad scale patterns that were like sex, you know, uh, or uh, age or something, just really big things that I'm like, okay, that's not really what I'm getting at here. Like I want something more clinically relevant. Um, so uh, by kind of making it only about a specific circuitry, a, a specific portion of the brain, uh, we were able to find actually much more interesting um, patient subtypes that were um, more to do with actual clinical features beyond just age and sex. Um, so you may find that um, doing a pre-selection of some kind actually is very useful in practice to what you want to do, but you don't have to do it. And there's no computational limitation saying that you should do that. Um, yeah, and it's robust to different types of noise. So I didn't show it here, but it's pretty cool. Um, it essentially is uh, able to do a denoising um, if you have data that uh, has noise, different types of noise added uh, to the same data. Um, when you do fusion on it, it denoises it. Um, so it's, it's pretty nice uh, for finding um, uh, a nice signal through noisy, diverse data. Um, after fusion, uh, after the network fusion, can you extract the features? Yes, that they separate the different groups. Yes. Um, so uh, this integrative feature selection, I just want to make sure. Oh, yeah. Okay, scalable. Um, you can. What you can do here, um, Astrid, this is a great question. So one thing, um, here I'm showing different um, uh, kind of different non-omics data where uh, they went through and evaluated, you know, how uh, related are these different clinical features to these clusters that I've come up with. Um, but what similarly you could do is um, go through um, everything that was used to create these clusters and see how those relate to the clusters you found. And in, when you do that, so what I'm saying here is essentially like a t-test or a, a, a Welch's uh, two sample or, or um, a Kruskal-Wallis uh, test here to say, you know, are the means of each probe different um, between these groups? Um, and then you just rank them based on their p-values and you find which features are driving this uh, in essence. Um, so you can do that by hand. You just write a loop and you go through um, and uh, I'll show you uh, everything but that. I don't think I'm gonna show you that exact uh, procedure in the R script today, um, but I think it should be um, easy to do. Um, but you essentially go through and you just test every single feature that you put through um, SNF and just say, is there a difference of means um, or is there a difference of group uh, numbers, counts, if it's categorical data uh, between these groups and then just rank them. And that's how you would, uh, that's how you would see which features are really driving the clustering. And a great question um, about uh, SNF working with missing values, that, pa that paper is forthcoming. So uh, I know that uh, Bo and uh, a couple students are actually working on it. Um, it should be out uh, or submitted at the end of the summer, but right now, no, no missing data is okay. Um, you can uh, you can interpolate your data, uh, like you can you can um, um, impute your data, I should say. Um, though, I the imputation, it's important to know who was imputed um, when you go and evaluate it downstream. Because uh, what I found sometimes is uh, I'll, I'll just do like a median imputation because I want to like not have a very informative imputation. Um, and then I'll find that kind of one group is like sort of my other group. And they're just like the imputed group that just didn't have a lot of inf information. So maybe they're just like low um, sample um, patients that I have in my set. Um, so you can do that. Another thing is if you're doing imputation, um, you may be kind of helping drive the similarity uh, because if you're imputing uh, based on other features from other patients um, and then um, kind of uh, predicting the value, the missing value, 
um, you are sort of contributing to the similarity between the patients that way. Um, so that's where I would caution against um, kind of an informative imputation. Um, but uh, Bo's most recent work coming forth uh, will have like a, a different imputation method that allows you to kind of overcome that. But right now I would say is a huge constraint. Yeah, the missing values hurt a lot. Um, so when fusing the omics data, uh, what methods are available for scaling different data sets? Aha. Yes. So um, in terms of scaling, so you're always going to standard normalize, but the scale between the different data sets I should show here, the scale is actually the similarity space. So it's, it's dealt with if you, um, so for example, in this example here, uh, Sank, you gave um, RNA-seq and flow cytometry. What you would probably have is a RNA-seq data set here and then a flow cytometric set here. And then within it, um, it's, it's dealing with the different scaling between the two sets by just transforming it into a patient, sorry, remind me later, into a patient similarity network. So you don't have to worry about scale differences between data types, but if you have continuous data, you will in general want to like have a normalization procedure so that especially, I mean, I, I think about this with um, gene expression, you know, um, certain genes just are expressed more, like you just have many more of them uh, in the genome. So they're kind of uh, distributed on a different scale than other genes uh, where you're just going to be observing less. And so you may want to actually do a standard normalization of those because you'd want to say, you know, is this gene overrepresented versus if you don't scale it, it'll say, the genes that are um, just expressed in higher values, higher numbers, those are actually going to um, impact the distance between patients much more. So you'd say those are more important for determining how similar patients are to each other um, than those genes that are not expressed at high levels. Those are less important. That's what it would essentially do. If you normalize it though, you're saying these are all have equal importance. Um, and I wanna say, you know, are you relatively overexpressed or underexpressed uh, for each gene? Um, but if you do that normalization within your data types um, and then do uh, similarity network fusion, so you, you create these similarity networks, the scaling difference between different data types is totally handled. Um, so you, there would be no scale difference because now it's all in the patient similarity scale. So I showed you before, you know, how um, a lot of times you can uh, integrate this clustering or, or do your clustering and then check after the fact um, if you've distinguished uh, groups that are surviving at different rates. Um, you know, there's no intrinsic link between clustering and survival analysis, um, but uh, because it is combined so often, I think it's really nice to go over how those are connected and then in the um, uh, lab, we're going to go over that uh, kind of in an impl implementation sense. So, you know, do your clustering, get your clusters, and then do a survival analysis and evaluate your clusters based on um, some survival based outcome. So we're going to talk about survival data, um, hazard rates, survival functions, um, the Kaplan Meier estimator, which we already looked at and, and went through a log rank test um, that uh, it's an example that we're going to go through. Previously, this was cut, but I'm going to keep it, okay? It's a little bit of math. Um, and then the Cox proportional hazard ratio model, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with and is, I would say, by far the most common model used, even though uh, the accelerated failure time model is also very popular and I think very famously um, preferred by Cox himself. So <laughs> if, you, if you find you're dissatisfied with the Cox model, even he would support you using an accelerated failure time model. I'm not gonna go over those models today, um, but I really encourage you to look them up and, and go through them. They're great tutorials um, about the theory of those models, as well as um, the actual implementation in R. It's very basic. So um, if you can do the Cox modeling, you can do the accelerated failure time modeling, just fine. So survival data. Survival data has actually um, got multiple components to you. <clears throat> so the first um, component is the time to an event, and it has to be one event. So there are many different types of survival modeling where, you know, you could have multiple events, you can have competing events, um, and you're considering the fact that people live like multifactorial lives where, you know, they don't die of cancer or, or die of one type of cancer and nothing else happens to them ever. Um, but in its simplest form, 
uh, you have one event and you assume that in the long extent of time, at some point that event will happen. And uh, some data on patients may be missing. So we talked about this before, those censored observations. Um, and so it could be you, they've lost, been lost to follow up. Um, the death occurred at some point, but you never got to see it. So you know that they survived at least a certain amount of time, but not, um, you don't know when the event actually occurred. So we would call those censored data. Uncensored data is when we observe the actual death time. Censored data is that we know it's beyond that time. And again, this is an assumption of survival modeling. You're assuming at some point the death actually happens. The event that you're interested in actually is happening, um, but uh, you didn't actually see it. Um, <clears throat> and also uh, really importantly is uh, in creating a survival model, if you have sensor data, um, you have to assume that it's not informative. So it could be that, you know, all the patients that are censored, um, actually they live, um, uh, or they live much longer. They're, they're all correlated with each other in some fashion. Um, this has to not be the case essentially uh, when you're doing survival modeling um, for that censoring um, kind of assumption to hold. So it can't be the case that like this one, you know, um, Oh, I see. Yeah. You want to just say like, yeah, you know, this person randomly moved out of town, not like, oh, yeah, this whole group of people just went through a totally different um, uh, kind of drug trial and they all have like a really different experience of life and we've only followed them up to this point. Right. Um, so you need them to be uncorrelated, essentially. Um, your eyes are not, uh, your vision didn't just uh, blur. This is actually um, this uh, slide, but I really liked this. Uh, uh, at some point I'll make one myself, <clears throat> this figure. Um, so we have different cases. So these are individuals and this is the survival data we're observing here. So um, we have the days to last follow-up um, for the patients that we didn't actually get to see their event at the end of the study. So this would be a censored observation. And we'd say six years um, is the event time for them, but the event um, itself of zero and one, it would be zero. So we would say at time six, you know, we saw for patient four, um, no event at this point, but they lived at least that long. Um, whereas for patient five here, we'd say they lived one year and we observed that event. We observed that they died within a year here. Um, similar patient three, we observed they died at four years. Okay. Um, so these are our censored observations and they're both censored at six years. Um, but in general, these censored um, observations, it'll be at different time points. So two very important statistics here uh, that I've been kind of alluding to the, the time to the event. Um, and that time uh, is uh, reflected in your survival function. So um, like we were seeing in that, um, uh, the KM curve, uh, the survival function um, is showing the probability uh, of a person being alive uh, at T or any time above T, okay? Whereas the hazard rate is the probability, probability of an event happening at time T. So here it says in the next instant, it's kind of, if you think about a derivative, like it's, it's looking at at that point in time, how many, like, what's the likelihood of an event occurring? Um, and what's really nice, if you look at, um, you know, you look at your cam curve, but then you have like a hazard um, curve, you can see how the likelihood of an event happening kind of changes over time. Um, so maybe there's a, a huge probability of, of death happening at one year, but then after that year, uh, maybe it actually goes down quite a bit. Um, so uh, it can show this kind of transitional um, uh, probabilities over the time course. Um, so some examples of that a hazard rate, uh, a concert, a constant hazard rate. Uh, so like no aging is uh, kind of the idea, but it's like um, you're equally likely to die at any point. Like there's just no, um, whereas what we know is um, as you age, um, there's a higher hazard uh, of death, um, uh, though there is a pretty high hazard of death very early in life as well. Um, particularly in certain groups of patients. Um, a positive hazard rate is the older you are, the more likely you are to die, essentially. This is what we're mostly familiar with. 
Um, and a negative hazard rate is dying risk is the highest at birth. So if there's high infant mortality, um, so if the rate is going down as you age, and we see this in certain populations, as I said before, um, where the likelihood of death very early on is high. Um, and as you survive past those time points, your likelihood of dying is actually quite, quite low. Um, okay, and we can see this in the KM curve. Um, it's not showing the hazards, so to speak, but it is reflecting that same data. It's uh, plotting our um, survival function. Um, again, this is ancient uh, from the perspective of everything we're looking at here. Um, but the KM uh, estimator is, uh, it stood the test of time. Um, and so it's just plotting the your data. Um, and that is the survival curve. It's the probability that a member from a given population will have uh, a lifetime exceeding T. Um, so you just have the number of people at risk. Uh, so that's just the number of people in your data at time T, uh, the number of actual deaths at time T. Um, and so then you say, uh, of the people who are at risk, how many died? Um, and therefore, how many are surviving um, here? Um, and you aggregate that over time. And that's what's represented here. Um, so this is what we were talking about before, where you can say, you know, what's the probability at 500 days uh, you will be alive, given each of your groups. Um, and we would say, you know, it's about 90% if you're experimental and 100% if you're standard. Um, you can also look at it from the percentage, uh, so the median um, here, and say uh, the median follow-up times here for uh, the experimental group was 1,000 days and for the standard group was actually a bit over 1500. Okay, so you can kind of slice this both ways. All right, so I'm gonna go through uh, a test you can do, and we're actually going to do this test um, later in R, um, but I wanna go through kind of the math of it um, because I think it makes a lot of sense. Uh, and also it's good to just have this slide um, as reference. So let's say we're comparing two groups like we often are with survival. Um, and J is distinct events in either group. So the J's are the different groups. So for each J, uh, we've got a number of people at risk. So that's just the number of people, right? The same N as before um, in each group. And then the overall NJ is just uh, combining those two groups, okay? So group one and group two. And the O's are the observed number of events, okay? So these are just the total number of people and these are the actual events. Um, and then this is across both groups here. So the OJs. So our null hypothesis is that the two curves are the same, right? That the, the risk of an event in either group is actually, it's no different. Um, and that's what we wanna test here with a log rank test. So um, given that uh, OJ uh, happened, uh, so given there's an event across both groups in time, um, we know that um, the event likelihood in one group is hypergeometric. And we can take that expected value here. So this expected value, it looks uh, kind of weird at first, but all it is is saying, this is the number of people in your group. Okay, so a single group. So we want the expected value for a single group. It is just the, the probability that it happens overall. That's just the expected value, right? So we just say, overall how many events out of how many people, and then take that proportion and multiply it by our individual group. The variance is a bit more of a complex term, but needless to say, this is uh, just derived from the hypergeometric distribution. Um, but from this, we can actually get a Z score um, summing up over our different groups to see how much are our obs observed values. So here, it's not this OJ, this overall, this is the actual in-group observed value. And we want to say, is it happening more than we would expect it to? Okay, so it's, it's just actually standard normal distributed here um, very conveniently. And so from this, you can actually see, am I observing more events in my group than I would expect given that my expectation, my null hypothesis is that we all actually in all the groups have the same likelihood of an event happening. Um, and from that, you can actually just get your p-value from a lookup table. So these um, are easily computable values, um, standard normal distributed, and then you can compute, you know, how likely is it under the null hypothesis that the distribution is the same. 
Okay. So um, it's quite, you know, classical statistics here. Um, again, sorry for a, a bit of a blur here, but um, what I wanted to show you is the hazard ratio. Um, and this is what is being used in um, Cox modeling. Okay, so the hazard ratio is taking what's observed versus expected. So what we saw from the previous, um, uh, the previous slide, these are the same um, statistics here. So our observed group one versus our computed expected group one under the null hypothesis that they have the same uh, likelihood of happening. So that there's no difference between the groups, okay? Um, and so then this hazard ratio is looking at the relative um, risk of having an event relative to uh, the expected uh, likelihood of having an event um, in each group and comparing them in a ratio fashion. Um, so that is to say, if you have a, a hazard ratio of 0.43, the relative risk of a poor outcome under the condition of group one is 43% of group two. So group one has a lower risk than group two, 43% uh, lower. Um, if the hazard ratio is two, then group one is two times as likely to have an event than group two, right? So this uh, numerator is two times uh, the size of the denominator here, okay? So that's how these would be interpreted. So now we go to the Cox model, and what they're modeling is actually this hazard rate. So Cox captures how well multiple variables affect survival. Um, by using uh, the Cox regression. So the hazard ratio of the risks here, it says here's the hazard ratio um, for a given individual at a given time. Um, there are multiple ways to compute this baseline hazard here, um, but this can be thought of as kind of like an intercept. So this, everybody has this baseline hazard rate. And it says, all right, given your covariates, how does this hazard, this baseline hazard change? And what's really important is it's exponentiated here and it's multiplied to the baseline hazard. Um, so it's, uh, it's a multiplicative effect on that hazard. So H0T here is the baseline hazard. Other predictors are exponentially increasing, exponentially increasing the hazard. Um, so here, uh, if you think about uh, this, again, is the Cox model, um, BJ, it represents the log hazard ratio um, increase for one unit increase in the predictor, holding all other predictors constant, okay? Um, so uh, here, we have it up here. This is um, how much your hazard is increasing, um, holding everything else constant. Um, the hazard ratio increase for one unit increase in XJ is the exponent of bj, okay? So you have one unit increase in x, now you have x, uh, or your exponent to bj, and you have this multiplied now by your baseline hazard, and that's your increase. Um, if your uh, coefficient is less than zero, it means you're increasing, if you increase your x, it's a decrease in hazard, um, and longer survival times, okay? So decreasing hazard rate, similar to that interpretation before, you know, if your hazard ratio is 0.43, it's a, it's a lower risk of an event, meaning a longer survival. So let's talk about using and interpreting Cox pH. So let's say we have a hazard ratio here for a subject I with a set of predictors X, and we're comparing it to subject J with a set of predictors X, right? Uh, what that would look like is your hazard ratio, I, J, you computed this based on your Cox model, um, the baseline has, um, and so <clears throat> the ratio between the subjects actually uh, comes down to the exponent of beta times the difference um, in your predictors, okay? So it's just like linear regression. Um, it can be interpreted as a percentage change in risk, similar to kind of what we were talking about before, um, even bringing up Cox, just the hazard ratio. Um, it's a percent difference between groups. Um, so if X is one, 
when treatment's active and zero when treatment's a placebo. Um, if the hazard ratio uh, is 0.8, it means that there's a 20% decrease in mortality risk if using the treatment compared to placebo, right? Because this beta is activated when you have X equals one. And when X equals zero, you have, uh, it is not activated essentially. So you're multiplying your baseline hazard by um, 0.8. And so 0.8 is All right, so how would you actually evaluate um, your survival model? Um, one way of doing it is using the concordance index. Um, and so concordance actually captures the ability of your model to order the individuals correctly uh, with respect to their survival time. So it's essentially placing them in order as to when the events happened. And the way it's computed, again, we're working all in the similarity space here you look over every pair of individuals um, here. So first, this is just the number of all pairs, okay? Um, and now you say over all individuals, how many of them are ordered, every pair of individuals, pardon, how many of them are ordered correctly? Let's give them a one. And any that are tied, um, so they're just at the same time point, um, they're not ordered correctly necessarily, but they're um, tied. Uh, so it's not before or after, it's not, right or wrong, we'll give them half a point essentially for that. Um, and this is computing, you know, how well ordered are your patients? You know, you could be way off in your survival time predictions and have very good concordance. So uh, it's something to consider when you're using this metric, but this is the only metric that actually captures the ordering of your individuals. So you can evaluate your um, model based on its ability to get the time right but if you want the order right, if you want to be able to say, you know, this person's more likely to die early and this person's more likely to die later, um, concordance is really going to be capturing that performance for you. Okay. Um, 